as I said, turning the next homework instead of that pile of paper, just you know, just send it to me electronically, and I'm should be nice. Um, how do I turn this off? Okay, sorry about that. I'm. <laughs> I don't want you guys to read my mail. Um, um, it can cook. It can do <laughs> everything you think of. It does. No, it doesn't. No. <sighs> All right. So I think I'm ready to start the the tape now. Okay. Thanks. Um, oh, I'm not. Let's see. So before I, I just want to mention one thing about um, the this kind of probability models. We haven't really started talking about seriously, so we should hopefully today. Um, but I do want to point out one of the books that I um, listed in the syllabus. Um, well, there are lots of places you can find. Well, let me let me say this: you can find, you can make any model. Uh, you can include a probabilistic, um, a random, kind of a, a non-deterministic um, component, and then make it, you know, stochastic probabilistic model. So, um, but the ones that are kind of a good, uh, good, good uh, sample of those. Or some some example of such um, are in this one book, Mathematical Modeling for Life Sciences. So if you go there, you will see a few of the chapters, starting with chapter five, uh, talks about Markov chains and diffusion. These are two topics we're going to actually cover. Um, chapter six has some more, um, you know, random processes and also has a little bit of statistics. So um, I'm going to refer to some of this when I start talking about uh, mark of chains and diffusion. But um, you know, feel free to browse through this before that. Um, OK, so last time I kind of gave you an example of, of a uh, random variable that has a Poisson distribution. The wrong one. By the way, this comes with a stylus too. So I'm not going to be confused which stylus to use. For all the devices you have. Um, okay, so so if I have x to be a random variable, which again in the discrete case is just like a function from the sample space to the real numbers. So this would be a real random variable. RV for short. Um, then we talked about expectation, right? And expectation really means kind of an average. Um, and we, we are going to be define this for continuous um, random variables as an integral but if it's if it's discrete random variable then we know it, it it what this means is so discrete is simply a summation of um, over all possible you know you can say over all possible numbers all possible values that this random variable takes of k times the probability that x takes the value k. Okay? So the, and then, depending on the experiment, depending on the random variable that you're observing out of that experiment, you know, oftentimes you can actually compute this explicitly. Okay? So this is for discrete, and we'll see what it, what it means for, for continuous. Um, the next thing is the variance. And let's see, I think that's 
the notation may change slightly. I think I just used the one that's in the book. Um, the variance of a random, discrete random variable, let's say, is actually the expectation of if you want of a, of a new random variable defined as x minus its expectation squared. Okay? So again, for now just think of discrete random variables where you have x takes a discrete set of values. Okay? So if x is um, Let's say what's an even simpler, um, a simpler. To, uh, well, let's say that that the experiment is tossing uh, one die, okay, and x is um, is a function that that assigns zero if the die is even. And one if the die is odd. Okay? Yeah. So, I mean, this, okay, this is probably oversimple, I mean, too simple to have any meaning. But maybe, maybe it's, think about the one with two dies and take the sum of the two. But if, if it were like this, if you toss uh, one die and you take this, then obviously what would be the expectation? Well, there is only two possibilities, zero with the possibility for the outcome, right? Zero, uh, so this is zero times the probability of x being zero, and that's always zero, plus one times the probability that x is one, and that's a half, right? So the expectation is a half, and what's the variance? So that's, well, what is the... To compute the variance, it's enough to compute what is the x minus this expectation, right? And what is it, what is it going to be? Negative a half and one half, right? If the number, the die appearing on the, the number appearing on the die is even, and a half if it's odd, right? Yep. So. So what's the e minus x minus e of x squared? Well, it's always one quarter, right? Well, if you have a random variable that's constant, obviously the expectation of that random variable is is that constant, right? So it's so the random var the variance of this random variable would be one quarter, and so again, this is maybe too simplistic, but I just wanted to sh kind of to, um, you know, uh, show what that formula means. Um, and so that's the variance, and of course there is a so-called standard deviation. Which says, which is defined as the square root of the variance. So this is the variance. Um, maybe just use sigma sigma of, of x. So this is the square root of the variance. So it is, you know, the formula becomes maybe a little bit harder to memorize, but it's expectation of x minus expectation of x
squared everything to one half okay so it's a number so in this example it would be one half right in that simple example it would be one half meaning that so you would say that the random variable has expectation one half and variance one half right uh, and, and standard deviation one half okay so um, you can actually do this obviously for other uh, distributions so so for example Poisson distribution so if you have a random variable such that the probability of it being a uh, Taking the value n is what was it last time we, we wrote down? e to the minus lambda n lambda to the n over n factorial. No, e to the minus lambda, excuse me. <coughs> yes, question? Um, I was just wondering what is the application of the variance? Because I'm pretty good to emphasize. Um, one four. So what does that mean in this simple example? Nothing. I mean, uh, it's uh, think about it. The standard deviation as being the, oh, the ultimate goal. Yeah. I mean, standard deviation is is has has a meaning. So okay. we know that. But um, okay. So for the Poisson, for a random variable having this kind of distribution, right? So we're not saying what the experiment is. We're not saying what the random variable is. We're saying any any random variable that has this distribution, right? Um, has, and we said last time, has the expectation to be, well, it's simply the summation of over all n, positive n, I guess starting with 0. So n starting from 0, 1, 2. Um, of n times probability of x being equal to n, and this ended up being equal to lambda. So, so this parameter lambda was, well, this is a with rate lambda, is uh, signifies exactly the expected value of this random variable. And let's see, if you are to compute, um, well, Okay, so there are two ways to go about computing the uh, standard deviation or the variance and then take the square root, right? Um, so one way would be to, you see, by the way, the, uh, the variance is the square of the standard deviation. So oftentimes you just write like this so instead of the variance, uh, and it's going to be expectation of x minus expectation of x squared okay and um, it's not maybe uh, that hard to see but it's not easy either to see what the expectation of so so applying this formula directly would, would actually make the computation a little bit harder because we know this is lambda right and then you would have to compute the expectation of x minus lambda squared, right? So, using the, the using this route, it, route it would actually look like it's going to be a summation of what? Somebody tell me. Squared probability that x x minus lambda squared is n minus lambda squared. So it's not undoable, but you know, so, so again, this probability is the same as the probability that x is n, right? So then you plug it in and you you do the, uh, you know, the series, you compute the series, and what you're going to get is, again, that this is lambda, okay? 
So the square of the, of the standard deviation is, again, the variance is always, always, also going to be lambda. Uh, I, I'm going to leave this as an exercise if you, if you don't object. Um, right, because zeta minus lambda n, I'm sorry, lambda to the n over n factorial, right? You're, you're experts in computing series, right? From calculus too, so you, you know, to compute the series, you would just, e to the minus lambda is a constant common factor, right? So here what you would do is square the n, uh, square the n minus lambda, right? And then you're going to have three series. Okay? Do the math, and it's going to look like it's going to it's going to simplify to just being lambda. Okay? So this Poisson distribution has this specu well, spe uh, very special feature that you have a variance and expect expectation is is again equal to lambda. Um, now there is an alternate way way to compute the variance or the you know the square of the sta or the standard deviation and that is um, that the expectation becomes expectation of x squared minus the expectation of x squared. Okay. Now you can actually, you can actually see this uh, if you do the same. So why is this? Because what was the definition? Was x minus the expectation of x? By the way, sometimes we're going to use e of x without parentheses. This term is expectation of x, right? So what's the expectation of? Well, what's this random variable that we take the expectation of? It's x minus a constant square. So you can square this, then minus twice x times e of x plus e x squared. So this is for a general. This this computation shows. Um, Is is a valid for any any um, well random variable. So even if it's not discrete, but if it's discrete, is um, expectation of a sum of random variables is the sum of the expectations. Okay, so there are certain properties that one uses, and those can be formalized very careful. Uh, it's linear in the random variable. Yes, it's like an, being an integral, right? So that's why it's good to think about it as an integral. Even though one is discrete, is is, uh, is is really a sum. But think about a sum as an integral. Then it's, you know that when you integrate a sum of two random variables, is the sum of the integrals. So okay, so this is now also the, uh, a constant comes outside of the integral sign, right? So you have the expectation of x times the expectation of x. Yep. And the last one is the expectation of a constant random variable is is that constant, right? So you see how you end up with expectation of x squared minus twice expectation of x, the square of the expectation of x, so it's minus you pretty much have to know when to put parentheses and when you don't have to I mean to be uh, least confusing, I guess. But obviously, this confirms that. Uh, so, so an alternative way would be to let's say for this Poisson random variable, it would be that's for the Poisson distribution. It would it would lead to. I mean, not, not a huge simplification, but some, uh, it would tell you that 
the um, variance of the square of the standard deviation is the expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation of x. Um, and again, each of this is a is a series, but the one for x squared is slightly simpler to write. It's n squared, but times the probability that x squared is n squared, which is the same as probability of x equal to n, right? So it's <coughs> and, and we know what the, other, the probability of x squared, we know this is already lambda. Yep. So you see, it just kind of um, simplifies a little bit because, I mean, I'm saying these things, but maybe it's not clear. Why is the probability that x squared is n squared is the same as the probability that x is n? Because it's a Say it in a sentence. Yeah. No. Yeah. So why why are these probabilities the same? Is the probabilities of is the probability of what? Okay. When we say probabilities, probability of what? Yeah, and that, what is that? That is, that is an event. Okay, it's the probability of an event. In an event, the event that x squared is n squared is identical with the event that x is n. Right? Of course, assume x, you know, x is positive. X only takes a positive. Right? So these are the exact same events. That's why. So in probability theory, you can always kind of. It's like taking the square roots, but you don't take the square roots, right? You just, you just say, well, this event can be written like this. Slightly different, right? It's the same event. It's rewriting the event. So the power, because you can rewrite the event, the exponent and, doesn't matter. Well, and you're going to write it in the simplest way possible. You know? So an event could be written like in a very comp convoluted way, right? Or in a simplified fashion. And so, but oftentimes you can actually you can you can pursue the computation by re rephrasing the event you're looking at. That's you know, yeah. So like if X so you're talking about the dice. Yeah. X represents the sum of two X. Right. So X squared is at the sum of two dice squared. Right. Right, so the event that this happens is identical with the event that this happens. They're the same events. They're the same subsets of the sample space. When you run your, when you run your, you know, uh, runs. No, well, what did I say? When you run your runs, when you when you uh, run that experiment several times, right? The outcome that x squared is n squared is the same as the outcome of that x is n, right? It's just a rephrasing of the event. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, okay, I'm, it, it is specialized to this, but I wanted to make sure that because oftentimes in this computation we'll, we'll just re rewrite the event and we're going to say probability of this equals the probability of, of something else. And uh, I know people have, have a, you know, Sometimes a hard time saying, "How come I just take the square root? What is that taking the square root? You know, how come, right?" It's just re, re saying, re saying that same, 
uh, event in, in different words. So, and then of course this is uh, now it's e to the minus lambda lambda to the n over n factorial. Okay, so you see the slight advantage here is that this is one series compared to the before you had three series coming from the squaring the n minus lambda square. Not a big advantage, but some, yeah. In general, is that this going to happen if your function that you're doing with the x and the n is the inverse function over your set? Say again? If is this, is this going to happen in general if the function you're doing in your test has an inverse function on your set? Yeah. Yeah, you can, uh, right, I mean, you're talking about this, right? The fact that the events are the same. Yeah. 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 I mean, the square is not important. It's it's true that it's because of one to one. So, it, you know, that has an inverse. But um, okay, we'll see this again. That's why I want to kind of uh, emphasize it. So, uh, okay. So when you do this, uh, it's gonna you know this lambda square is gonna be get. You know, uh, eaten by some term here, which is going to be lambda squared. So, what what comes out is just lambda. Okay. So, again, for the um, for such uh, distributions, for for Poisson distribution, this is what you need to remember: is that that um, if it is a Poisson distribution with rate lambda, then the expected value of that random variable is precise lambda and the, the standard deviation is square root of lambda for any x random variable with Poisson distribution. Okay, so um, so why do we, why, why are these things important? Well here's, here's a, a, a one thing that's important to uh, write down and to understand. It's called the strong law of large numbers. So it says that if uh, I have a sequence of random variables Um, with same distribution and uh, they are independent so that's going to be a new concept, new independent random variables And of course, moreover, well, okay. Um, then this average over the first n, so this is called a Cesar average, but it doesn't matter how it's called. It's the average of the first n random variables. This in itself is a random variable. You agree with that? Because what is a random variable? Just a function. Okay, in this discrete case, right? <coughs> so you can add two random variables, you're going to get a random variable. You can get n random variables, so you're going to be a random variable, right? So this is now a new sequence, and this sequence converges to a constant. The constant being the expected value of of each of the random variables, therefore of all the random variables, because the random variables we're, we're starting with is all have the same distribution. So so if, since they have the same distribution, why, why, how come they have the same uh, average or expected value? I want to make uh, another. We want it to be finite. So, of course, the example we talked about is 
uh, it's clear that they're, it's finite, but you know, this is might be applied. You know, you could try to apply it for there are there are random variables that have uh, infinite uh, expectation. So, yeah. What you just wrote. Uh, it just says even capital X. I. Oh, I. So, so basically uh, what I'm saying is that because they all have the same distribution, probability distribution, they all have the same expectation. Right? Because expectation is only depending on the probability distribution, right? So they all have the same number. The expected value is the same for all random variables. Call it e of x, right? So this is e of x1, e of x2, e of xn. All of them are the same. Well, so, so the strong law of large numbers says that as n goes to infinity, on average, if you want to uh, think of it like this, the, um, the average of, the, of these random variables converges to, the, to this expected value. Okay. Now, the key ingredient here is that this is these random variables are independent. So, what does it mean that we have independent random variables? So, independence is kind of the uh, the foundation of the of the probability theory, and we're not going to do much of it. Uh, um, I mean, theoretically, but just just to say that if I have two events, so two events, A and B, of course, these are subsets of this of the same sample space, are called independent if. The probability of both occurring at the same time, and that's the event of A intersect with B, right? The event of A intersect with B contains all the outcomes that are both in A and in B, right? So if I if I if I remember this sample space, right, and I have two events. Then I'm going to have, if if the experiment, if a run of the experiment ends up with an outcome here, then it, both events are occurring, right? So we say that these two are independent if the probability of the intersection is the product of the probabilities. This is very different than the probability of the union, for instance. Probability of the union of two events is. Um, we talked about it earlier, right? We said that if if the two events are disjoint, so they are, they are incompatible, right? So all this wording is kind of um, takes a little bit to digest. But if two even, the events are are incompatible, then uh, the probability of the either of two occurring is the sum of the probabilities, right? If if there are if they have an overlap, then uh, is the sum of the two probabilities minus the probability of the of the intersection. So, so this is actually different now. It says it's a property of the intersection only, which of course would spill in the pro in the probability of the of the union. But it's it's a specific property of the intersection. So, for instance, if I have two events that are incompatible, are they going to be independent? No intersection, what's probability of the empty set? Zero. So for them to be independent, one of them has to have probability zero, right? So if I have two, two events that are incompatible and neither has probability zero, right? Then are they independent? No, because it doesn't satisfy zero, it's going to be not equal to the product of the two. And that makes sense because it says that if they're incompatible, and one happens, the other doesn't happen. So they're not independent in that sense, right? If one happens, the other doesn't happen. Now, of course, there will be 
cases when um, there are probably there are events that are overlap and they're still independent, right? It just has to have that pro this property has to hold. Okay? Yeah. Yes, you can have, but yeah, so certainly. Have right. Uh, and you can, uh, I mean, again, we can cook examples of that. Um, throwing two dice and looking at I don't know, probably that one has Uh, that one has, I don't know. You probably hmm? just, just come up with two probability with two events for which the there is an intersection and the intersection is either has this property or doesn't have this property, right? Um, yeah. Right. Uh, so that the sum is even. And the other event would be that the sum is no, that would be incompatible, right? Um, the other one is that the one of them is even, right? Right? Or I don't know. You so let's see. They, so they can overlap and have both. They could be independent, or they could overlap and they could be not independent, right? Uh, but let's see. Is there a possibility that one is a subset of the other? If one is a subset of the other, the intersection is the smaller of the two, right? So how can a probability of, of, of the smaller of the two equal the product of the probabilities of the two? Well, the probability of the larger one has to be one. So the larger one has to be the whole set. So that's, it's also uh, uh, not, a, not a poss possible to have two events, one a subset of the other, unless the big, well, and the big one should not be the whole set, right? Then they're not independent. And again, it makes sense because it says if the smaller one happens, then the larger one happens, right? So it's not an independent uh, pair. Okay, but again, we could we could spend a whole lecture on on, on just the significance of independence. And this, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to have the time. But it is an extremely important. Well, it's the most important uh, concept in probability of independence. Um, now, what this has to do with the random variables, though? Well, so here's what it has to do. So two random variables. X and Y are independent if the probability that of the event where uh, one takes values within a range and the other takes values within another range so by the way, this is just this is just saying that this is one event, right? This is another event, and when we say this and this, we mean the intersection of the two, right? So that's the same as the probability that the product of the probabilities. Okay, so the pro the rand independence of, of two random variables reduces to really the independence of the events when the random variables are within a certain range. Okay, which in discrete in the discrete case it would be even it would reduce to even more uh, you know more restrictive case. For instance, the probability that x is n 
and, and, and y is m. Let's imagine I have two. So for discrete random variables. So by the way, this the one above, it's, it's really true for continuous uh, also. But for discrete random variables, um, when you say that something is in a range, I mean you can you can narrow that range until until you only kind of in your range there's only one value, right? So so it says the probability that x takes a certain value and the probability that, and and y takes another value is the same as the probability that x Sorry, I'm, sometimes I'm using accolades, sometimes I'm using square brackets, sometimes I'm using brackets. Um, but this is what independent random variables mean, okay? And, and this is if, if there are two of them, right? And now you can, you can think about uh, probability that, uh, you can talk about independence of not two, but, but any number of random variables, right? So, the f formalizing this concept is, again, is very important in probability, and it's something we're not going to have the luxury to go into much detail. But I want to show this to you on, ooh, on a um, practical problem called, let's say it's the, well, it's a, Manufacturing problem of it's a problem coming from manufacturing diodes or any sort of electronic um, components, and it's kind of at the beginning of chapter seven. So um, let me just summarize that the problem is quality control. Of this product that is that is being uh, uh, manufactured, so there is a testing for um, faulty diodes. And one way to test something uh, like uh, you know you you manufacture the same product over and over again is you take individual diode you can take each of them and test it right if it's good or bad right if it's bad you throw it out if it's good you keep it right so certainly that's you know that's gonna do the job right but um, it's not going to be the most efficient way. So, just simply because of the costs that are going to be incurred. So, so the testing for faulty diodes will be done as follows. So, can be done um, in two different ways. One is, as I said, individually. Um, at a cost of five cents each diode. Or it can be done in groups of diodes. And here's how that's done. So let me let me show you individually it would be you produce one diode, then you test it. You, then you produce the next one, and you test it, right? And there's going to be some of them that are going to be faulty. And, and each of them, and the ones that are faulty, you just label, you, you put them on the side, right? So you can, you can uh, see the cost. If you have a 1,000 diodes producing and you do it individually, it's going to be 1,000 times 5 cents each, right? So it's very simple. The question, though, is: Is there a cheaper way of doing it? And um, the answer will be yes. So the groups of diodes is going to be 
the following. So if I, for instance, decide I'm going to do groups of three diodes. So an example. I'm saying um, I'm just picking an example. So if I'm picking groups of three and I test them, I test these groups as an entity, each as an entity, right? And I, when I put this, whatever, uh, in series, so if I, if I test a group and the group ends up being good, then the conclusion is that each member of that group is good, right? If the group is bad, then what, what, is, what is the next thing to do? Then we know that at least one is wrong, faulty. So then we're going to test individuals in that group. Okay. So the whole problem is figure out which one is the more efficient way. And we should know what is the cost of testing a group. Uh, so this at a cost of 4 cents a group. Okay? Is it, yeah? Is it possible to do that like three or four times? Three to or four have, times. To have a, a really large group identify a bad group, break it down, and then break that into smaller groups. Sure. Sure. But but that's not um, that's not our problem. Our problem is between these two, if it is to, to decide on a on a on a on a strategy, the strategy is how many uh, how large groups should we should we use the first time. Four, four, okay, four questions at once, okay. <laughs> Something must be wrong. <laughs> so, when a group fails, that costs, you know, four cents to test that group, but it then be five cents for each individual after that? I was going to, that's my question. Uh, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, good question. So, so you're right, so maybe, maybe I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll fix this because, because I'm sure you read the problem before, right? So this is really 4 plus n. But yes, um, after if this is faulty, then you do it individually, and it's going to be 5 each. OK? 4 plus 5 n. Four, four. OK, let me, let me just set this up here so you can see. So, so OK, so first group. Uh, n diodes, excuse me. N is the number of diodes. So this this picture represents corresponds to n equals three. Okay. So, um, so okay. So, so, um, what is the problem? The problem is the goal. Determine an optimal strategy. That is, what should be the number of diodes to be tested at once in a group, such that the total cost is minimized. And you, excuse me. And of course, you still want to uh, exhaust, like. Right? Every single one, you want to pass the good ones and, and identify the bad ones. Yeah. Well, but you don't know in ahead of time. Until you test it, you don't know if it's faulty or not. Well, yeah, I know, but like, if there is a faulty diagram, what's the consequences of costing that money if it's faulty? Again, that's, that, would be an, that would be an additional thing in the problem. I mean, all of this, right. I mean, if you see yourself with a hat in that factory, yes, you, it's, it's legitimate to ask all those questions. Yeah. But the point is, you don't know. So you don't know your ratio. 
You know your ratio. But what you know, okay. So what you know is you know the uh, probability. Let's see. So I'm missing something. You're right. So I'm missing the probability that um, that a, a, a manufactured diode is is faulty, yeah. right? So so um, right. So the probability. So that's an assumption. Is the probability that on uh, that? Well, let me just say how how they say it here. So the assumption is is that 0.3% uh, of all diodes are faulty. Okay, and this can come from whatever. Right? from some previous experience. Okay, so so here's here's kind of the where this strong law of large number comes in the picture. So think about the first group of diodes. What would be the cost of testing that group? The, the cost is going to be uh, either four plus n. If whole group is good, I mean each member in the group is good, and it's 4 plus n plus 5 times n if, if at least one diode in the group is faulty. The cost. I'm, I'm, I'm saying the cost. So, so here's here's the the thing. C1 is a random variable. Okay, and maybe you don't want C1. Let's call it X1. So I'm saying this is going to be X1. I define it to be this random variable, which represents the cost. Now, it's a function that takes for the first group of diodes, right? Any outcome of that manufacturing and testing process, right? And it assigns a number to it. Yeah? Now, why is that? Why is that a random variable? What? Why is this random? I don't know whether it's four plus n or four plus n. Well, is that true? So each will have some probability of occurring, right? Yeah. So the event, so, so, so underlying this, there is this sample space, right? So the sample space is, is I'm picking n diodes, and they may all be good, some may be wrong, right? So with some probability. Now, um, do you agree that this is a discrete random variable? It only has two possible values, right? Now the sample space may not actually be discrete or finite, right? It's actually it's even hard to dis define what the sample space is, right? The sample space is the p is the an outcome in that experiment is you pick a group of diodes. And they all may good, some may be bad, right? That's the best you can do in describing the sample space. Yeah? But the random variable is very simple to write. And now you do the same with the second group. And it's going to be exactly the same. Now, it's not only that it's going to be exactly the same distribution, right? But can we say that the first that, that these two random variables are independent? Well, I don't know. So, you can argue not, but I was going to say it wouldn't be independent because the probability that you know 
two diodes and the second group is faulty would not exactly it, a direct outcome unless you you pick the second group from the faulty ones from the first group like if there's replacement which, there right yeah if you don't if you don't do that right you just have like a a, a sea of diodes right and you just pick groups right. right those are I don't know intuitively they're independent right yeah that's good enough for us okay for me at least so same distribution and this is the same with the kth group okay and that's where I should have anyway they call it X can I change it to XK doesn't matter N was for a number of diodes but okay so so XK now, why do we even say these are distinct uh, random variables? Why not just say this is only one of them? I don't know, because the time sequence, you take the first diode, right? You test it, then the second diode. So they, they are, they are not the same, they're, they're different random variables, but with the same distribution and they're independent. Yeah. Yeah, they're also going to be different. So that they're not the same groups of okay, anybody has anything against this? That they're not the same random variables? Although they have the same distribution? Because they, they actually physically, uh, you observe different things, right, in different experiments. Yep. I mean, it gets it gets a little bit, uh, if, you're, if you're really analytical about this, you, you, can, um, you can have issues, but we, we don't want to have too many issues with this thing. What the point of this of this exercise is that we want to um, draw a practical conclusion from from this uh, from these assumptions, okay? And that is very simple to do. So the distribution of x i is going to be always the same. It is four plus n with probability, with a certain probability, and 4 plus n plus 5n with a certain probability. Now, here's where um, we have to talk about probability of, uh, of, of, of the event in which the whole group is good. If I have n, and, uh, and diodes, and all of them are good. This means what? This means that each of them in, a, in that group is good with a probability what? 1 minus 0 0.0003. Uh, yeah, that's 0.3%, that's right? And because each is each diode is good with this probability, how can all them, all, all n of them be good with that probability? Again, assuming they're independent, then this would be the product. So it's the product of this. And what's the opposite? Well, the complement is going to be with probability. So if I call this p, then it's going to be probably 1 minus p. Okay? So that's how we find the distribution. And then what is the expect, expected value of this? Well, it's simply taking the values that the probability, that the, uh, each of this random variable takes, 4 plus n times p plus 4 plus n plus 5n times 1 minus p. Now, this is not pleasant, but it can be written explicitly. So 1 minus 0 0.0003 to the power n plus what's 4 plus 6n 1 minus 1 minus 0 0 0.0003n. So it's 1 minus that power of n. Okay, so take a look at what, we, what we've gotten. We've, we've just simply gotten a function of n n is a number, it can be 1 to a million, right? n in a, no? And 
we, we have this sequence of probability of, of uh, random variables. By the strong law of large number, we can we can say that on average when I have lots of groups of such Run of, uh, of such uh, uh, so when, when this k is large enough, when k is large, the x1 plus xk over k goes to this, or let me say it's close to. I'm not. We're not taking a limit. We're just saying when k is large. This average is is this number, right? Now, in, in in words, what does this average mean? Right, x1 was for the first group, x2 for the second group, xk was for the kth group. So this is simply saying, what is the average cost, right, for testing? A group of diodes, right? So this is the average cost cost uh, for testing the first k di uh, the groups of diodes. Okay, so if if k is large, this is actually what you want: is you want this quantity. So the objective is you want to minimize the cost. What did I say? We minimize. Go to the determine opposite, such as total cost is minimized. Uh, wrong. Well, let's see. Is it the total cost or is it the It's not the total cost. So if I if I could change it so you can see is the cost per diode so the, the point is you want to minimize uh, the average cost for a group of diodes divided by the number of diodes in that group so this is the average cost per diode. Until now x was the average cost per so this is the cost per group of diodes, right? Okay, so this is all kind of setting it up. Uh, what is what is then the, the uh, um, the actual solving this is so, so that step in which you solve the model. So you have to minimize one over n times this messy thing, which was four plus n zero point zero nine nine seven to the n plus four plus six n one minus zero point nine nine seven to the power n. Okay. What is going to be your favorite uh, tool? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Say it again. Yeah. Run. Yeah. Random. There's not nothing random at this stage. You see, you just need to minimize a function of n. I mean, you can actually, yeah, you can actually simulate. You can actually show that this uh, this is the average cost. But but in the end, it's just a, an optimization problem of one variable, right? Just differentiate 
so yeah so if you could differentiate set derivative equal to zero and check whatever uh, fine the problem here is going to be there's powers and in the power and in the in front right so it's not going to be a, an easy way to differentiate right uh, so you can try symbolically but what I would say is just plot plot uh, or you can actually run a search you know uh, through the possible values but it's a nonlinear optimization one dimensional optimization right and whichever way you do it, you will see that 17, again, it may be 17 or 18, and then you have to decide which one. 17 is the optimal. That is the minimum number, the minimum cost on average, right? So the optimal strategy will be to take groups of 17. And if a group is faulty, then you're going to test it individually, right? And then you can figure out what the minimum cost is. Okay, so uh, a big part in this model is, is actually just setting it up, figuring out what are the random variables. How can you use the tools of probability to actually reduce it? But I'll tell you that this is a little secret. In this whole business that we do for the next three or four weeks, we're going to actually end up with a function to maximize or minimize. Okay. So the, the whole thing is how, do you, how can you actually bring it down to that level and then just use an optimization tool to, to, make it, to, to draw your conclusion, okay? So, um, and again, we're going to learn other things about probability, but not everything. Uh, we're going to learn next Wednesday about continuous random variables and how you can use that for modeling certain processes, okay? Hopefully I'm going to have the iPad working by, <laughs> by tomorrow Wednesday. It will work better. My lectures will be...